of the architecture schools stop teaching drawing. That was the year that AutoCAD had uh, just finished about a 10 year run as being a global leader in uh, computer uh, product production. And, uh, and 1992 was also the year when Form Z entered the scene. And so with Form Z as a 3D modeling program, the first one that really had some teeth to it, with AutoCAD, the schools realized they need to teach this in order to compete with other architectural schools and uh, in order to and to, get to uh, add these classes in, in, in Form Z and in AutoCAD, they had to drop some other courses and then drop the traditional drawing courses. That's a generalization, but that's what I believe happened. Now, that architect that graduated back in that year, or the series of years, would be about 45 years old today. And so that's, that's when it happened. Now, in 2002 and 2012 were another giant leaps. And 1992, uh, that is when um, that is when Cork Express, now the desktop publishing industry, came to play. And Cork Express had a 10-year run from 1992 to 2002. And then in 2002, Adobe launched the Adobe Creative Suite. CS1 was launched in 2002. Also, right around 2002 was another big year. Now, the internet's all happening right behind all of this. 2002 is when um, uh, LCD screens came into play. That's when the laptop kind of began to surpass the desktop. Uh, that's when the big monitors, uh, computer workstations, began to double up because you could get flat screen monitors. That's when the digital camera came into play. So digital photography suddenly put an end to film photography in 2002. Big year, giant year in how things began to evolve. And then we had this enormous run in 2002 to 2012 with all of the digital revolution and everything. And then in 2012, another the thing happened. The iPhone became a very dominant source of image capture and it pretty much is putting the digital camera out of business. And now, because everyone's taking pictures with their iPhones, the, you know, the cloud and digital tablets are coming on board, and now everything's beginning to change. Now, what that does to us as visualists is it says, all right, we've got to keep up with this technology. There are going to be a lot of dinosaurs out there. These are people that are in their 40s and 50s that haven't kept up with technology, and they can draw, yes, but they don't know how to weave technology in with some of those traditional. What I think is exciting today for all of us um, as educators and students is that with a digital tablet, I think that's going to give us an opportunity to jump back to some of the traditional forms of visualization, hand, eye, brain, and uh, it may not be a traditional pencil on a piece of paper, but it may be a stylus pen on a, on a touch screen, but we're doing the same thing. It's communicating in the same way. And that's what I think is really exciting about what we're doing. What I'd like to do tonight is uh, to take you through kind of uh, uh, some traditional um, design visualization uh, options and tools, and then work my way into the hybrid and, and technical integration of, of, of uh, traditional drawing techniques with digital tools. Um, in the process of design visualization, uh, it's, it's always a good strategy to kind of think through, all right, how do I want to start getting some big ideas down on paper? And those big ideas can start with just a thumbnail sketch. It can be uh, something just uh, in the, in the left-hand image, uh, a series of little uh, vignettes that show how one would travel down a street. And you can see the ones that are circled uh, or eventually blown up and then uh, turned into a larger drawing. Uh, big idea generation can be a very, very quick sketch on the left. A friend of mine uh, did this in just 10 minutes, just scrubbing it out. You can see how rough and loose the detail is. And then eventually he traced over that and did something with a little bit more uh, the radiation and color to it. But, uh, so it doesn't have to be 
a sophisticated drawing right off the bat. Think in terms of how can I get that idea down in just a thumbnail sketch? Really small. Um, it can be uh, with such um, little detail that you often have to add annotation to it, some notes, so that you can understand what it is. And those notes really help uh, reinforce that sense of uh, I'm just a big idea that's happening right now, it's temporary, it's throw away, I'm just trying to get it down on paper as quickly as I can. Once you have two or three of these things, then you can kind of vet out which ones make sense and then eventually turn one of them into a more sophisticated drawing. Now, in a design charrette, this is very common, where you cover the wall with sketches, uh, trying to come up with um, different views or different ideas. Uh, all of these little black and white uh, sketches here are all trying to communicate one idea. The idea was to come up with a, um, uh, an infinity swimming pool in a resort. Costa Rican's at the resort, and you can see there's some of these sketches that don't quite capture that idea of the infinity pool, that edgeless pool where you look beyond the water and you see nothing but ocean and sky. Well, eventually, all of those sketches were developed uh, and refined to the point where I was able to do this one drawing. This was done just a, a pen and ink, a felt tip pen on a, a piece of tracing paper with um, colored marker on the front and back side and uh, trying to capture that. Someone asked, why don't you put people in there? Uh, and I said, uh, the client didn't want any people in these renderings because uh, those individuals that were looking at these promotional renderings would uh, want to have that sense that we're the only people that are going to be at this resort and we're going to be all alone, which is great. I had filled this up with kids and people and activities, then they would have said, I don't, that's, that's Disneyland, I don't want to go there. So we purposely didn't put any people in this. Big idea generation can be a series of sketches. Uh, in this case here, I had um, uh, to try to understand what one would go through all of these different exhibit experiences in an aquarium. So I cranked out probably 20 or 30 of these things. Just kind of coming up with an idea, okay, um, walking under a waterfall, okay, idea, looking at a big wave splashing against the glass, okay, squeezing through this tight little space in Utah Canyon in the flash flood, that kind of thing. You come up with an idea, and then you just try to thumbnail sketch it. Um, in this case here, <clears throat> I've got a little uh, notepad on the upper left uh, where I just was scratching down some ideas on a, uh, a little courtyard view. And it was from that one little thumbnail sketch. I said, OK, well, this is what I'll do. So I went ahead and uh, found some uh, pieces and parts, uh, uh, built a little SketchUp model, which was this, what I'll call a stage set model. And I'll explain that a little bit later. And then just fitted it out and put a piece of trace over the top of it and just scrubbed out a quick drawing out of a splash of color, and that was done. I'll start it with that thumbnail sketch. A concept visualization is where you take that thumbnail sketch and you develop it a little bit further. Um, in this case here, uh, all of these drawings are the same size. Um, they are all trying to illustrate um, a very, very large shopping mall in the Middle East uh, with a, an indoor amusement park, an indoor, a big aquarium, and uh, and so here we are, just cranking out these little concept sketches. Uh, and there it is on the left of this aquarium. Now, that was at about six by nine inches. And then I eventually turned that into a more sophisticated drawing by uh, creating it in red pencil and then eventually tracing it over, printing it, and coloring it in marker. Now, concept visualization is um, great so when you're dealing with, uh, let's say, you you've got a, a project in which you're designing a campus. So in this case here, a friend of mine uh, is designing a, a, a tropical resort. Uh, a lot of pieces to that resort, the little boathouse, the hotel, the restaurants, all that. So he's generating a series of different concept uh, sketches trying to visualize uh, those elements of that resort. And in this case here, um, Frank has this 
kind of a, uh, he can visualize without having to rely on any kind of computer model or photography. So he's just doing all of these from imagination. And uh, so the perspective's not perfect, but that's okay. He's getting this down on paper and has a very loose uh, style of drawing. Here in this case, here you can see the thumbnail sketches uh, on 8 half by 11 paper, uh, annotated notes, things like that, and then how that uh, eventually turns into the larger drawing. Now, further into the project, you might be developing ideas, things are beginning to settle down, and uh, you're getting a, a kind of sense of the direction uh, to the point where maybe you build a SketchUp model. And, uh, and then from that SketchUp model, you can uh, generate some sort of drawing from that. In this case here, this is a SketchUp model that is a, what I'll call a massing model. It doesn't have a lot of detail to it. It just has some lines that represent floor to floors and uh, perhaps unit widths. Uh, but it's a basic dumbed-down SketchUp model, but it's a large site. What I did is I printed it onto a matte paper, uh, probably 30 by 40 inches. It was a big drawing. And then I just drew right on the print with pen and ink to put all of the uh, windows in and the more landscaping and cars and people and flesh it out. And then I just colored it in after that with marker and some colored pencil. And that's uh, uh, design presentation drawings can be a really nicely crafted hand drawing or a hybrid drawing that can also be uh, uh, a little bit more of a sophisticated computer rendering. Uh, in this case here, this is a SketchUp model. This is uh, one of the first kind of explorations into a digital watercolor process, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, it starts with a SketchUp model. So that's what you're looking at. But what I do is I print um, that SketchUp view onto a matte finished paper add a colored marker and pencil and uh, some other things to it. But then I go back and I scan it. And then uh, in Photoshop, I apply a watercolor filter to it. So it really softens it up and roughs it up. Um, now, of course, there are cases where you'll see the demand for photorealism. Um, a lot of projects in the Middle East that I worked on, and also in China, uh, that was the demand of the clients. This is a big, high stakes real estate hot market, and they needed those photorealistic renderings to really uh, accompany big animations and physical models and all of that. So, but how do you get from from that SketchUp model to the enemy to this kind of uh, sophisticated drawing? I don't do it. I don't pretend to want, even want to do it. There are lots of, of companies out there that are um, uh, professional rendering companies. Uh, this one here is uh, in China um, that do this on a regular basis. And they have a lot of very talented people that can do that. So, but they can't work without us as art directors, as designers. So we're doing the basics. We're coming up with a design. We're building the SketchUp models. And then we are helping them through the process of the, of the visualization. Not, and determining, well, let's do a nice scene, let's add some more yellow here, let's add some more people there, that kind of thing. Um, now, if I were to boil down the kind of drawings uh, in traditional senses, uh, I would have, uh, I'd start with your, your classic observation drawing. This is the um, sketchbook. and. Uh, uh, taking taking uh, a trip out uh, lunchtime uh, on a weekend, going on a field trip, and just uh, sketch away. And that's hard for a lot of us to do. I find it really hard to do. I almost want to just take a quick digital photograph and keep going. And, uh, and I'm hearing that Lauren is taking students out now with, uh, with uh, tablets, and they're actually doing field sketching with tablets. I think that's really great. I have not yet to do that, and I think it's worth uh, uh, spending some time and trying that out myself. There are lots of people that are filling sketchbooks, uh, uh, websites now, the urban sketchers, um, people that are, a uh, whole movement of people that are out there in sketchbooks, throw them up, 
And uh, he's a friend of mine, an architect, that uh, always has his uh, uh, sketchbook. And he, I asked him, what kind of pen do you use? And he said, I use just a standard Office Depot roll of all pen, because it glides better on the paper. And he said, I've tried everything else, but this is the best one. And uh, wherever you are, um, uh, this was a conference I went to up in um, uh, Wisconsin, and uh, everyone was out sketching and uh, uh, doing water, field watercolors and all of that. It doesn't have to be big, and never have to apologize for doing uh, a lousy drawing uh, because uh, you're one out of 100 people that actually is drawing the other 99 don't even want to get there. So uh, you don't have to apologize. Take a vacation, stop, and sketch wherever you are. Um, that is, uh, uh, it's a real joy to do that, and a real sense of accomplishment when you can come back with some sketches and show them to others, and, uh, and they go, wow, I'm amazing. How did you do that? Well, I just, you know, just spent the time to sketch. The, uh, Another form of drawing is the imagination drawing. Now, this is when you are staring at that blank piece of paper, and uh, you are just trying to, you're not tracing the photo, you're not looking at something, you're not uh, tracing over a computer model, you are basically trying to come up with what's in your mind's eye. And it can be terrifying. And uh, that is uh, uh, something that, uh, uh, takes a bit of courage to do, and there are, I've seen people choke uh, in meetings. They have that piece of paper in front of them, and they cannot draw with, with beans. So, uh, that's, uh, imagination drawings are, uh, think of it as cartooning. Uh, uh, this was something that I did recently uh, with, uh, at a city council work session, a whole city council. We were, um, it's a three-hour work session, and I was, it's called visual scribing. And as people talked, and they would say, uh, they would say, well, what do we like about uh, our city government? What do we want our staff? Uh, what do we like about our, our town? Well, we like the rural character, and we really like our downtown, and our diversity, and all of that. And, and as I'm hearing these keywords, I'm cartooning it. Now, these cartoons are only about three by four inches. And we, as soon as we got them done, two of us were doing this, we would put them on a copier right there in the council room and blow them up 200% to 8 and a half by 11 and tape them to the wall. By the end of that meeting, we had 65 drawings cartooned. And, uh, and that uh, really supplemented all of the uh, words that were being written down, and that those drawings stayed on the council chamber walls for two months. And uh, so it's, uh, that is one form of, of imagination drawings, that visual scribing. Um, and cartooning is another way, and, and it can be a, a, a very sophisticated drawing, like that one on the right. That was um, an imagination drawing that I did for a ski resort in Los Angeles that was uh, right over the highway. And you would get, uh, it was all a plastic ski surface, and you would get a half day of skiing and a half day of surfing all uh, with your one ticket. And then park in the shade beneath it. Um, now, now to the, some drawing types. And, uh, this is the heart of what I do an awful lot of. It's the basic overlaying trace, the method of drawing. Um, you start with your base information. It can be a photograph, it can be um, a sketch of a model view, uh, you just simply print it out and then put a piece of tracing paper over the top of it and uh, work up the additional detail that may not be in the original uh, source material and then you trace over the top of that to get your final drawing. Now here's how to do it. Here's a photograph of a, uh, a, an old downtown that had a narrow sidewalk and failing uh, businesses and they wanted to imagine what it would be like if we were to just double the width of the sidewalk and add some outdoor dining and outdoor furniture and some landscapings and trees, things like that. And so what I did is I printed the picture and then I traced over the top of the picture with red pencil um, to add all of those elements that you see there, the, the people and the landscaping and the signage and graphics and things like that. And then I traced over that once more with a line drawing and then colored it in. 
The Rubber Rain Trace method, um, it can be a very loose drawing. Now, this is a wireframe uh, uh, wire model, an AutoCAD uh, view of a large church project. And it was just a crude model, basically slapped a piece of tracing paper over a print, eight and a half by 11, and just um, scratched out a quick drawing, added little notes, and added a splash of colored marker to it. So it doesn't have to be a, a sophisticated drawing. It would be very, very loose. And um, these kinds of drawings are, are, they come across so effectively as an in progress. This is a design in progress. It's not a finished rendering. It's not completed. I'm just kind of working through the design process. And this is a beautiful way of communicating that without getting bogged down in too much time. Um, take a photograph of an old uh, uh, shopping uh, center and then just trace over the top of that at a second floor and then show someone what it would look like if you were to add on to the building and redo the front of that building. The uh, uh, overlay trace, that's an existing park uh, they wanted to put a small zero garden in the front of this pavilion. So I went ahead and I photographed it and then traced over that with some red pencil, made that line drawing, and then colored that uh, print in with marker. Uh, and in this case here, um, think in terms of when you're, if you have to take a photograph, always art direct your photograph. I didn't just stand there and just, just take the photograph of that park. I actually stood on the roof of my car so I could get up higher, a higher vantage point in order to get more of that ground plane in there and make a little bit better drawing. So you know, if you uh, try your best, if you can take your own photography, then basically really take a lot of different pictures and try to compose this before you, uh, with, with the final drawing in mind. So you can see here, original photograph, Layering on the park uses, the new bridge, doing the pen and ink drawing, and then um, coloring it in. One of the things that I commonly do now is I always scan my drawings when they're in progress. Uh, that black and white pen and ink drawing, I, I scan that so that uh, uh, I have a good record of it, so that if I had to color it in later on and I messed up the color, I could always go back to that original black and white, print it out, and then go forward with it, so you don't lose any ground there. Um, the beauty of technology today is that we all have um, uh, more and more of us now own those three in ones. Show of hands, how many of you have at home or in your room um, a three in one printer? Scan, copy it, yeah, it's practically everybody. Um, so now, instead of having to rely on the technology at school, now you can do it at home. Do it eight and a half by 11, you have full control over the outcome and uh, uh, from the standpoint of printing the original picture to scanning your black and white to printing out the final color. So um, the overlay trace can be a SketchUp model. In this case, a friend of mine in Memphis uh, started with a block model, SketchUp massing model. You can see how absolutely minimal it is. And then he went ahead and he did this uh, marvelous uh, uh, area perspective of this building, basically creating from that massing model. Here's a massing model that I did for a large uh, uh, Middle Eastern project. Uh, all I did was uh, um, create the block buildings and add some line work representing the floor to floor so that I could kind of keep track of the scale of this because it was huge. Did an overlay and trace and that was it. Um, relatively um, quick drawing, you can see it's very loose. It's very <coughs> roughly drawn um, without a lot of uh, attention to fine grain detail. It's just very, very scrubbed in. And again, that was to emphasize the in-progress nature of it. Now, with drawing tools, um, what I've uh, found is the kind of the four basic markers that, uh, uh, that I use um, are the Chart pack 80 marker, which is the one on the top, and then the, the electric set, the Prismacolor marker, and the Copic marker. Uh, all in my book, and every, everything that I promote is, is, has to do with the chart pack uh, 80 marker. It's simply because 
I believe it has better um, uh, flow characteristics and it has, uh, it's the best price. Uh, it's cheaper. The one that's the most expensive is the Copic on the bottom. Now it's a beautiful marker. Uh, doesn't last that long, but they do have some great colors. And, uh, uh, and, and I'd love to just get into a lot of detail about, about markers, but basically in short, the bottom three are alcohol-based uh, markers, uh, and the top one, the Tri-Pack marker, is a xylene-based. That's why it has a strong smell to it. And it's a xylene that makes it flow so well uh, on paper. So um, that's why I promote it. And it has the greatest amount of ink uh, in it, so uh, why not? Um, they really have this problem. It's, uh, it only happens once. Uh, it was a waste of a good cup of coffee. <laughs> the uh, markers are great. Um, uh, if you're working on trace, uh, the trace is so thin that you can color the front side and the back side. That's beautiful because if you want to build up colors a little bit, um, you can just put some blue on the front and then flip it over and put some blue on the back and, and uh, make it a little bit darker. Uh, if you have multiple colors on top of each other, sometimes it can get muddy. And so I might take and color some of the green of that tree on the front side and then flip it over and then color a little bit more on the back side so that the colors don't uh, collide with each other. Uh, you can color on a print. Um, make a print of your uh, line drawing and then color that print in with the marker. Now this is just solid, just pure marker, no colored pencil. And, uh, in high altitudes, I found that sometimes the air pressure inside of these chart pack markers, uh, when you uncap it, it actually blows out and explodes on you. And this uh, happened to one of my students. Uh, I'm just screaming, I'm taking my camera and taking a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. It's very funny. Uh, colored pencils, uh, uh, they're painful to use because uh, they're either broken uh, you don't have a pencil sharpener, and they really hurt your hand if you're drawing them off a lot. So what I, uh, what I recommend is just uh, uh, staying with uh, drawings that are very small. And uh, I, I've learned that uh, I'll use colored pencils a lot, but it'll only be as a supplemental color, but not as the, I won't do the whole thing in pure colored pencil, but that's just me. Around the world, here's, a, here's, a, here's an arch a landscape architect in Malaysia that does everything in colored pencil and a very beautiful, very lightweight, and very illustrative technique. So there are uh, lots and lots of designers out there that are specialists in colored pencil. Here's a, a Canadian architect that uses prismic colored pencils in a very heavy-handed way, very scrubby, uh, very colorful, exaggerated colors. I think it's beautiful. It's really, really nice. And uh, uh, Steve Olds, very famous architect uh, who was uh, uh, the illustrator for all of uh, Ian Pei's work. Um, and he uses uh, um, colored pencils on a kind of a rough, rougher paper to get this uh, textured appearance to his pencil drawing. So that's 100% pencil drawing with uh, prism colored pencils. Um, now, what I found is a great mix of the two. Color the whole thing in with colored marker and then add some colored pencil to the top of it just to give it a little bit of uh, texture. It gives that gradation to the sky. That's hard to do with colored marker. So what I do is I just grab a couple of different blues and then just scrub out uh, a gradation on the sky just to give it a little bit more texture and character to the drawing. Because sometimes uh, a pure marker coloring um, can be a little flat and a little uh, stale. So just adding some colored pencil uh, to a drawing can really kind of pump it up a little bit and give it some, uh, uh, some, um, some wonderful texture. The um, perspective. The two images on the left are the traditional uh, choices that uh, the pre-computer years this is all we have to work with. We have uh, pre-printed perspective charts, and we have either that or we had to do it by some sort of constructed perspective method, which was tedious and, and uh, uh, painful to do. But uh, now we don't have that. that. Throw that idea away. On the right-hand side, we can reverse engineer a photograph. 
and get our perspective from the photo, or we can create a, a model, a computer model, and get our perspective from the computer model very, very easily. Now, you have your traditional one-point perspective, two-point perspective. If you're looking at the corner of a building, that gives you a chance to look at a couple of faces of the building or the couple of walls if you're in an interior perspective. Or the three-point perspective, if you're looking most likely down at something, this is a great uh, tool with uh, urban planning projects so when you're looking at a site. Now, there's a lot of strategies involved in uh, doing perspectives. Think of it as, as this. If uh, a one-point perspective, most likely you're at eye level, and you're really just kind of doing a three-dimensional elevation of, of your object. On a two-point perspective, you're getting a little bit more of a sense of the three-dimensional character of your space or of your building and of the place. And then, but the three-point perspective looking down, it gives you more sense of context of, yeah, this is the, this is the building in the context of, of where, where it is placed in, in the lake uh, up against that forest. Or you can really try it yourself without any help whatsoever and really, really screw it up. And this was, this is, I did this one probably when I was, uh, um, 20, 25 years old, and uh, it's completely messed up. Um, nothing at all makes sense out of this drawing. It's awful. Um, now, the size of the drawing is really important. Now, those of you with your um, 3 one printers, think in terms of, okay, if I want to do this, and print it, and scan it, and all of that, maybe I should keep this 8.5 by 11 or smaller. That makes it easier on me. Absolutely. My real promote, I promote drawing small because you can scan it and then you can always blow it up. Um, because of the technology that we have and the high resolution scanning uh, machines, that's easy to do. A friend of mine on the upper left had a um, three by five inch note card that's, I don't know why he did this, but he scrubbed out a building out of a uh, uh, section and a, an aerial perspective of this new restaurant at that small scale, and then he just blew it up on a copier and then colored it in. And, uh, uh, but in the, on the right-hand side, if you're doing a very, very large planning project, it may require a large format drawing. You're going to have a lot of detail, and that's going to force you into it. So, but it, for all the basics of what we're trying to do, especially in academia, as, as much as possible, keep it 11 by 17 or even half by 11 so you can scan it and then um, you can work faster. The smaller you draw, the faster it goes. And you don't have to get bogged down in a lot of detail. This format of your drawing, whether it's a vertical, a vertical format or a long horizontal format of your drawing, may be dictated by what, uh, uh, what we were trying to emphasize. But more and more, I'm trying to uh, format my drawings based on how I'm going to present the drawings. If your presentation uh, is a horizontal or layout, uh, you may want to drift towards a horizontal format for your drawings so that they fit into that layout better. Um, imagine how that drawing in the lower right would look if it was published in a 8.5 by 11 vertical report, you barely see it because it would be so small. So that's important to kind of strategize. Before you ever get started on your drawing, what is the format? What's the proportion of that drawing? And how am I going to present it later on? The, um, whether you put a, a, a lot of detail into a drawing or a, a very minimal detail of a drawing, that changes the character of the drawing, but it also um, dictates how much time you spend on that drawing. At all possible, the less time, the better off you are uh, to get your point across. It's not may not be about the presentation as it is about the good design idea that you're trying to get across. The uh, in this area here, in this drawing, uh, I'm I'm composing this drawing with a big X uh, and four corners, and the, your eye is constantly kind of going around to all four of those quadrants, looking at what I've illustrated in this uh, tourist trap. The um, entourage that you put into a drawing is so important. Um, imagine 
what this would look like if it didn't include all of those elements that are, that are listed on the right. And that's so important. If you're putting together um, a, uh, a concept, try to think what elements would uh, help and reinforce that concept with a sense of, of activity, a sense of scale, Put the trees in, put the, put the people in, put the cars in, put the landscaping in. It, all of those add to that sense of this is a successful place. It's a vibrant place. And a lot of uh, uh, renderings that I'm seeing now come out of architectural firms are lacking a lot of this entourage. And it's because they're, they're in such um, need to get images out that they're not spending the time to put the uh, the layer on this extra layer of context. And it's really showing up um, with poor representations of, of architectural projects. People, how to draw people. In many ways, uh, you can trace them from uh, SketchUp people, from a SketchUp model. You can use photography. Uh, you can do them from imagination. Uh, anything goes. Uh, but layer people into your drawing. Don't be afraid of people put it in there, um, and uh, it'll really give it a sense of scale and a bit of, of humanity. And that upper right-hand drawing, uh, the people in the foreground were traced from photographs, where the people in the background were done from imagination. In the lower right, this illustrator uses photography. He takes, his pe takes photographs of people, and then he inserts them in Photoshop, and then applies a lot of filtering to those people to give them uh, a little bit more of a watercolor. I think he scrubs a little bit of line work on the top of them to uh, do a more of a hand-drawn look. So there's a hybrid. But uh, whatever you do, uh, always keep your people small. It won't, you won't get trapped in having to draw a lot of detail, and especially faces, which are really hard to do. Uh, keep them small, and if at all possible, trace them from, and, and I'm doing this more and more, trace them from SketchUp components. <laughs> And SketchUp models. Uh, here, this is uh, these are three-dimensional uh, people that were uh, components in the SketchUp model that are used to sketch from. Uh, using photography, uh, here is a SketchUp model in the lower left, uh, where there is uh, a combination of some three-dimensional people in the background, but then in the foreground, those are actual SketchUp components that were photographs of people in these scenes. And then I used, inserted them, and then this is a digital watercolor um, uh, that you see on the right. Uh, basically, it's sketch a model with marker and uh, with a watercolor filter. They could scrub it up and give it that filter. Cars are the same way. You can do them from imagination, or you can trace them from photography, or from, uh, and more and more from SketchUp models. And you'll see this right here. Uh, this is a SketchUp model. Uh, it's an overlaying trace. Um, no, it's not. Not an overlaying trace. It's uh, I printed the SketchUp view onto a matte finished paper, and then I just drew right directly on the paper with pen and ink and some marker. But those are SketchUp cards. Those are components. All I'm doing is tracing the edges, so I'm not having to struggle on how to draw a card because it's already there. I carefully placed those cards in the SketchUp model, knowing this is what I wanted. This is the view that I wanted, so I really strategically position those cars in the best place so that I could create that composition. Choose it the same way. You can draw them from imagination or you can trace them. Uh, anything goes. A lot of strategies from, in SketchUp modeling. But in, in drawing trees, what's your season? What's the, uh, uh, the species? There are some generic trees that I can do. Uh, but if you're a landscape architect, in a landscape program, you may want to get more specific as to exactly what species of tree you're using and not stay in there. There are a lot of, uh, uh, there may be some rules as far as you, uh, of what you do there. The, uh, now let's jump from traditional to digital and start to explore uh, kind of the process and the history of, of digital tools and modeling. Uh, at first, pre, now 2002, was also the year, remember that little chart that I had over decades, was the year that SketchUp was launched. 2001, 2002, SketchUp entered the scene, and it literally changed the game. It absolutely changed the rules in which how we visualize. Uh, but before SketchUp, 
We relied on FormZ and uh, traditional AutoCAD 3D modeling to uh, create those wireframes and trace over those prints and create those perspectives from those computer, early computer models. Now, um, with modeling, you can put together a simple block model and then just slap down a piece of trace and then just scrub up some ideas, some design ideas, and, uh, and then show those as in, in the process of, of in, in the process of designing and uh, putting together an idea. The, uh, uh, the sketch of Brad Shell and, and, uh, and his partner, uh, when they sold the Google, those guys uh, walked away with a lot of dollars and uh, they happily retired. Uh, but it changed. This is my very first SketchUp model. I imported a hand-drawn site plan and then built a uh, uh, block model on the top of that, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. That was, that was the start of it. Uh, and then every uh, architect, uh, uh, everybody has embraced uh, the tool, uh, the modeling tool, and, and we can build uh, simple block models. This is an architect in, uh, uh, in the Midwest that uh, uh, sketches over these block models and uh, uh, comes up with a lot of urban design uh, renderings, a lot of area perspectives. Uh, in this case here, this was a, a, an air show, uh, a model that I put together that uh, got so detailed that it, it, we never took it beyond the modeling phase. We just showed the model to the client. They understood what we were going after, and we left it at that. So uh, that's a presentation model. Um, and that's perfectly OK to do that, too. What I found in, in uh, a lot of uh, projects is I'll actually blend the two together. I might have, imagine you're putting together a project, and you have, you build a SketchUp model. You might have some true model views, but then you might have some sketches um, along with those model views mix the two of them together, the sketch and the pure computer model, and that tells a little bit better story as to what you're trying to communicate. And this was a very large uh, project, um, a whole city project in the Middle East that uh, um, I'm, I built this model, and it's, uh, although there are a lot of pieces and parts to it, the very dumbed down um, pieces that are uh, colored in with just uh, uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, kind of patterns, window patterns, but not um, a whole lot of detail. That model was then turned into a photorealist rendering by uh, these outside consultants, rendering consultants. Now, show of hands, how many of you are using SketchUp? Upstairs, how many of you guys are using? OK, pretty much everybody. Um, it's a good tool. And, uh, but it's, it's something you need to strategy. You, you've got to know some strategies and how you approach your SketchUp modeling because you can get trapped into too much detail. And I'm sure you have. Um, think of it in terms of three kind of levels. One of them is a stage set level. Build only what you're going to see. In this case, I'm gonna, I wanted to show the inside of this room, so I just built a model just of the inside of the room. There's nothing else there. It's a stage set model, just like you would build uh, if you were building or designing a movie set. Just enough that's going to be filmed and nothing else. <coughs> Second one is a massing model. The massing model is a block model. It has no detail. It just has blocks that give you a sense of scale and establish that perspective. And then you layer on top of those blocks any of the detail that you want to show. Another strategy is photo match. Uh, take a photograph and then integrate that photograph into your SketchUp model using that photo match tool. I've only used it a couple of times because it is a little tricky, um, and, uh, but that's another option that you have. Here's the photo match. Uh, took the original photograph that's in the upper left and uh, built a SketchUp model. Now, the upper right is a view of that SketchUp model from above. And you can see how it's just pieces, just little tiny pieces. But we went ahead and we put in that plaza in, in between those three buildings. And then you can see in the lower left, that's the original photo match view, and then a uh, sketch that what a student did of, of that uh, view. Now, another strategy for SketchUp is it becomes a tool 
that you integrate into the drawing process. And this, in, the, in a lot of uh, good designers will it's build a little SketchUp uh, study model, and then they'll print it out and they'll sketch over the top of that by hand, and then they'll go back into the model, revise the model, update it, and then they'll just go back and forth between what I call the um, the uh, screen and the surface. The surface being the paper, the screen being the computer. In this case here, the number one on the upper left, that's the original sketch that I did of the street scene. Number two is the first SketchUp model that the friend of mine built. Number three is a refinement of that model based on some client feedback. And then number four is uh, additional sketching on top of that print that shows more um, detail, more uh, entourage, more people. And then there's the final SketchUp model of that street scene. And this was uh, the entire process here was geared so that we could give this model to the renderers and then they would create that photorealistic rendering. So that back and forth with the goal in mind of doing this photorealistic rendering. This is uh, uh, visual photography, it's fantastic. In this case here, um, Google Earth, Google Street View is used to, for me to illustrate these two drawings on the right hand side. On the left, upper left, is a Google Earth view of that uh, downtown scene. And uh, the upper right is just a print of that that I traced over the top of and sketched in some buildings and some street you know, trees and other entourage. The lower left is a Google Earth, it's a street view from Google Earth. I, I saved the I saved the print and then I printed it out and then sketched over the top of it with some modifications to that street scene. So that's one way of doing it. Or you run out, take a digital photograph of that plaza, of that space, and then do a drawing from that digital photograph. The uh, X takes some, uh, grabs some images off the internet. Uh, lots and lots of images now available uh, off the internet. Use those as a source material for developing and drawing. In this case here, I wanted to do a themed drawing of a uh, 1950s diner. And so I just started Googling all of these diner images and collecting all of these iconic images of uh, 50s diners, and I integrated those into the final sketch. In this case here, a friend of mine, uh, this is uh, Hong Kong, um, took a photograph of Hong Kong Harbor uh, from a tall, uh, one of the tallest buildings. Um, then he, uh, you can see, he cut out the photograph. He probably did this in Photoshop, printed it out, and then he traced over and created a new uh, infill sketch of uh, a new harbor scene. And then he integrated the photography back into it and uh, uh, finalized his uh, sketch on the lower right. Start to finish, he said it took him eight hours. It took him just one day to do this, and, you know, which is remarkable. Um, the uh, story behind this is that you know, he was very upset with a uh, design direction that the Hong Kong uh, Coastal Commission was going, and he decided to give them an al another alternative look at this, and actually was able to convince them to stop the process and actually uh, we started with a, a new look at the, uh, uh, at the Harvard design. Now, uh, take a digital photograph. I often set up photographs in order to um, um, get the people placed where I want them. And uh, so don't just kind of sit there and take a picture. Wait for that car to come by, the right kind of car, or wait for that right person on a bicycle to go by, or people to walk by. Then you take a picture. Because you know you're going to trace some of those people or, those, or that car. And in this case here, yes, I positioned her in that position, took the picture, and then integrated that into the final sketch. Download pictures off of the uh, internet. I needed to illustrate a, um, an article on school safety. And um, uh, so I went ahead and found a lot of images off the internet and then I integrated those into the final black and white sketch. Digital uh, imaging. This is the next kind of big wave. Um, I 
did some visual scribing. That's me in the center uh, working with a smart board. It's a Promethean board or a smart board. Um, drawing directly on it with uh, basically a Photoshop kind of program software. iPad on the upper left. Uh, in the early days, uh, Sony products had come out, the Sony Play 8, I think that's the first one that uh, some people embrace. And on the upper right is the Wacom uh, Cintiq. So this is the next big generation of where we're going with it. I've got a Cintiq at home uh, where I pull around the digital painting, uh, importing. It's all done in Photoshop. Uh, I'm importing a black and white line drawing and then just adding digital color to it uh, and doing some fun things with that. Um, this is uh, uh, a drawing in which uh, I, I needed to illustrate this forest. So it was a national, it was a state park, and I needed to do this drawing. And I actually started, you can see a, there's a photograph of me using a, uh, a, a Stadler Lumicolor pen on Mylar. I thought that was the right way to do it. And I did the drawing, and that's the one on the left. And the trees were way too heavy. The, the lines were too thick. And I thought, oh, this is, the mind work is dominating this. So I said, stop. Um, so I scanned it, and I brought it into my Cintiq, and then I did a new drawing with a stylus pen in my Cintiq. And the, now the line work was only one pixel wide. So the new trees were just very, very lightweight, and I printed that and then part of it, and it was exactly the effect that I needed. So I, I started with a traditional hand-drawn uh, pen on Mylar, but then I ended up with a digital drawing uh, instead. And that's, now that's where things are going. Now, hybrid drawing is uh, where you mix the two. Now I'm taking and uh, using uh, whatever I can find as far as a digital source and then integrating hand drawing into that and really coming up with some cool stuff. Um, the first process is the overlay composite process. And this is where you use the overlay and trace method. Here's the SketchUp view. And I did a drawing over that print uh, of this little plaza. Now that's the drawing alone. That's the simple drawing, and it looks OK. And that's a standalone, good drawing, good enough to present. But I realized, what would it be like if I were to just scan the two of them together? And I went, holy cow, that's pretty cool. That is a composite drawing. Now I'm seeing my drawing show up, but I'm seeing the paving pattern beneath it now emerging, sort of ghosted in underneath the tracing paper. And I'm also seeing the block model and the whole world site. So now I've got a hierarchy going on here. And, uh, and that, that is what you can kind of generate with this kind of double scan, this double exposure. In this case here, uh, there's this SketchUp model on the top, and there's a composite scan below. You see how the buildings are ghosted in there? That's because they're just showing through the tracing paper and uh, it gives it a sense of atmospherics, the buildings in the distance. I'm going, wow, well, I'm onto something. This is pretty cool. Let's so try it again. And I realized, OK, if I were to take the SketchUp model, color it in, and then now I can add some white colored pencil, and the white colored pencil shows up. Now I can pop some highlights on the building. I can pop the highlights on the window mullions and, and all of that. And, and really start to work the darks and the lights into this scene. And, and, uh, and so you can see the final sketch on the lower uh, portion of this. That's, um, here's another one from the same project. There's a base SketchUp model on the upper left. That's the line, that's the overlay and trace in the right hand side. Now there's no sky, there's no blue in the water, but when you put the two together and you scan them together, that's what you get. And you get this beautiful, you are letting the computer give you the shadows, give you some of the base colors, and then you do the rest. So that's the hybrid character of this thing. It's sort of half computer, half hand drawn. And in most cases, you're looking at that and you're thinking, well, that's pretty much a line or hand drawn. But no, it's, uh, it's, there's a computer hidden underneath it. Um, same thing here. That's just the, uh, uh, the computer, a model on the left, and then my, uh, the sketch over that on the right. Here's a more sophisticated 
uh, serious drawing that I did of a waterfront. That's the masking model. I used that to get the approval from the client for the view. And once I got the approval, then I went ahead and built a more uh, detailed sketch up model of the, of the future buildings on the waterfront. The models in the background are just still dumbed down. So thinking there's another strategy. If, you think, if you're building a sketch up model, and you know you're just focused on the front foreground, put more detail into that, but skip the detail in the background. Same with trees. If you're dealing with 3D trees and components, put a couple of 3D trees in the foreground, but in the background, you can put all 2D trees so you don't bother your model down. So here's the line drawing that I traced over a print of that SketchUp model. Here's the line drawing scanned on top of the SketchUp model. Now I'm getting color, I'm getting sky, I'm getting shadows, not more depth to it, but that's not enough. It's still really flat and lifeless, and so what I did is I layered on colored marker and colored pencil. And this is just tracing paper. And uh, so I could build up the blues, I could get the white colored pencil to show the window mullions, and uh, we can see the reflections in the water. That's adding modeling it with colored pencil and colored marker. And there's a SketchUp model beneath all of that. And so here I am just adding that extra layer of hand-drawn character to a true SketchUp model. And that's the beauty of SketchUp, because I could do it myself. No one else had to do it. I could do it myself, and I could create this. But that was the beginning of this exploration. I went, oh, man, I've got a print of that sketch of view. Why would I trace over the top of it? Why don't I just draw right on the print? And I went, OK, now I've got a, another, another new way of doing this called a print composite. And that's where you print out your sketch of view and then onto a flat finished paper, a matte finished paper, and then just draw right on the paper and, um, and then see what comes out. Um, this is a, uh, a photograph, a digital photograph that I printed onto this heavyweight matte paper and then I just colored it in with some marker and some colored pencils and it just gives you a really artistic look to it, a really art uh, artistic feel to it. And who would have imagined that that's a photograph? It looks like a, a pastel drawing. And uh, here's another uh, exploration into the same technique. There's the photograph in the upper left. Uh, and what I did is I, I printed it very light. And then I colored it in with marker and some colored pencil. And then I scanned it and added a, color, a watercolor filter to it. And so that's the final product on the right. And uh, wow, I took a photograph and I turned it into some a semi piece of artwork. Uh, what it kind of says is it's great to experiment. Uh, anything goes. If you, as long as you kind of get a good feel for a hand-crafted uh, approach and a digital approach, if you can put the two together, that um, mashup of technology and tradition is a beautiful thing. I, I absolutely promote it, and, 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 and I think it's really a really great way to go. Um, take and print your picture and then print your sketch of view and then you just go right on top of that print with colored marker, colored pencil, pen and ink, anything uh, to really scrub it up and give it that handcrafted look. Um, why present just the sketch of view when you can just spend a little bit more time and add that authentic handcrafted uh, look to it. And that's, in that other words, a friend of mine doing exploration of some fine art stuff where it takes a photograph, traces over that, and then prints that onto a very uh, a rough paper, a very textured paper, and then goes over the top of that with a black pencil. This is, now notice how pale this is. This is a sketch of view, and I have dropped off the line work, and I've printed it very, very light. So I went into Photoshop, and I really dropped out a lot of color, and I printed it light. The reason is you print it light so that you can add color back into it. 
If you were to just print it straight from SketchUp, it would be too dark. It would, it would be, the end result would be way too dark. So export your SketchUp model, print it out, light, and then go over the top of that. In this case, pen and ink, and just using the rollerball pen, and then <coughs> adding colored mark and colored pencil. In all cases, when I'm exporting the SketchUp model, I always export it at a very, very high resolution, 5,000 pixels wide. That gives you, seriously, it's about 72 DPI. It would be any result after you resize it in Photoshop, it ends up being 300 DPI, 11 by 17. That's what you want to, that's where you want to be, high resolution export. So here's that same thing process, just printing it out and drawing right smack on the print. Uh, same process. SketchUp model that you see me up there left. Um, I was doing this downtown scene. It's a stage set model for which I built some of the building components. I built faces of buildings and then I just assembled them to create this scene and then printed it out and then colored it in with colored marker and colored pencil. Very simple um, and very effective. So that's, that's uh, that print composite uh, process is, is really great. <coughs> this was the cover of the book where I started with a SketchUp model, printed it, uh, filtered it, lightened it up, and, uh, and then I tacked it with colored pencil and colored marker. And you see the colored pencil in this case here really gave it that, uh, that texture and the hatching that really reveals sort of a handcrafted quality to it. But beneath all of that is a SketchUp model. Now, digital painting is uh, another approach on, uh, uh, on, on morphing uh, digital and hand drawing. This is a uh, friend of mine. That's a traditional watercolor that we did. The lower portion of it all is a traditional painting. But the sky is a, he layered that in in Photoshop. Uh, he cut that in in Photoshop because he couldn't get that, uh, obviously he didn't figure out how to, how to do the sky and watercolor, so he just took a shortcut. That shortcut was the beginning of his transition from traditional watercolor to digital watercolor, and that's exactly what Paul's doing right now. He is exploring, he's an expert in traditional watercolor, but now he's exploring how to integrate digital manipulation with, digital, with traditional watercolor technique, and he's coming up with some really interesting results. And so that's you know, people are doing that. They're embracing traditional technique with digital tools and seeing where it takes them. And that's part of the beauty of exploring uh, the creative process. Here's a professional illustrator that starts with um, hand drawing, pencil drawing, and he does a lot of work with uh, Photoshop and, and digital painting, all digital work. Um, here's another architect that uh, uh, sketch a block model, simple massing model, um, hand drawn, pen, uh, pencil, pencil drawing, beautiful technique, and then he just paints in uh, uh, areas of colors. There's only half a dozen colors in this, and it's just, he's just tapping them into these uh, cells. Uh, so he's not doing much more than just coloring them into solid, solid pieces of color. Here I am uh, trying to figure out how to do a digital, digital color using a Cintiq. Um, a recent project, the big aerial perspective that I did completely in a digital uh, tracing over a base sketchup model, but then the rest of it is all in different layers of color and pens. Um, and the final outcome, uh, I felt as though it was a little flat, so I printed it big, and then I just added a little bit of colored pencil to it to scrub it up a bit. And in this case, here's an illustrator out of Philadelphia. That's 100% digitally drawn with a Wacom tablet. Just a simple little Wacom tablet, and he's doing it all uh, beautifully. Uh, these guys are perfecting digital painting. Here's another uh, talented guy out of the East Coast. Uh, basic SketchUp model, pen and ink uh, drawing. Then he starts layering in his color, base colors, and then, uh, and then he starts to model the color later on, uh, getting the texture into the sky, into the, into, into the grass, the shadows, things like that. Beautiful stuff. And, and I wish I could sit down with these guys and, and take one of their workshops because I, I mean, I'd love to learn how to do this. 
even traditional watercolorists are, are, are embracing tech, this technique. Uh, there's a guy out of uh, the West Coast, uh, sketchup model, does a pen and ink drawing over that print, then he scans that drawing, lightens that drawing up in Photoshop. He really lightens the line work up, and then he prints it out onto heavyweight watercolor paper. Um, and, uh, and then he, he uh, mounts that paper on the data board, and then he paints it in with traditional watercolor. But after that, these guys are also scanning their traditional watercolor, and then they're going in later on, and they're doing some um, uh, post-production work on that watercolor with uh, Photoshop, adding additional boosting colors, um, adding shadows, doctoring it up a little bit. Now, visual watercolor is something that I've been playing around with, and it's just cool. It's really a lot of fun. Take and uh, uh, sketch a model. Uh, I found that if I can render that model first, I'm going to get really cool results. So in this case here, I rendered it with shader light. It's a plug-in to sketch up, very inexpensive. Shader light uh, gives you the reflections on the glass, gives you that reflection on the water, and it really gives you a much better character of light and shadow. You can see the side-by-side -side comparisons of how they look. Now, this is an article that I did for a landscape architecture magazine. Um, here's a stage set model, basic stage set model. There's nothing there. I'm actually floating trees in midair in order to cast that strategic shadow over that hot tub. Now that's the basic model of what it looked like when I was constructing the model. Here's the prime view that I established. So this is where I start. I get that view, I position those trees, I get those perfect shadows over those people in the hot tub and all of that. It's a mix of 3D sketch up people. Uh, those, are the, those are 3D people in the hot tub, but then there's photographic people too. Um, in there. So this is my base scene. Now from this scene here, I exported the line work, and uh, then I rendered the, the scene in shader light. And that's the picture of the whole rendering process happening. And this is what it looked like uh, after I get done with the rendering process. It only takes about 20 minutes to do. It's nothing to do. Uh, but it, 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 nice, nice quality of light. Now you can see the reflection on the glass, and there's a reflection on the swimming pool. You can see the water has a reflection to it, and it has a much better quality to it. Now, a lot of people would just stop there and just show that to the client and be done with it. What I did is I lightened it up, and then I printed it out on my um, uh, inexpensive printer. This is just a $120 printer that prints 13 by 19 inches. It's an Epson Workforce uh, 1100. So I printed it out on this really heavyweight paper. Uh, you can see how pale it looks. The print looks really pale. And then I went on top of it with colored marker. And I uh, also added a very light line work with just a standard uh, paper-made mechanical pencil from Office Depot. Um, all of that put into the artwork. This is a scan of the original artwork. You see how pale it looks? I know, uh, I'm purposely trying to keep it very pale because when I scan it and then I apply the watercolor filter, that's where I build back the contrast. So there it is, um, scan and the contrast is built back into it. And here's what it looks like up close. Uh, that's the digital watercolor. It, uh, the watercolor process gives it a real sense of uh, uh, things begin to blob, things begin to look um, a little textured, and uh, it looks a much more painted like. There's the straightforward SketchUp model on the left, and then there's the uh, digital watercolor on the right. Much more um, romantic looking, much more character and personality to it than a straight uh, uh, SketchUp model. So these are examples uh, that I was playing around with with, sketch, with digital watercolors. So these are all the same thing. Uh, here's a close-up of this office building, uh, of that entrance to the office building. A straightforward SketchUp model on the left, and lower left is the rendered version of that shader light. 
And then on the far right is what it looks like after the digital watercolor process. You can see how textured it is, and it looks painted. Uh, but that's just marker and that watercolor filter. And what it does is it makes the edge of the marker a little bit darker, as if the paint is blobbing. Um, and that's characteristic of, of watercolor, uh, the actual paint. Here's another one. Here's another one, an interior view, digital watercolor. And uh, so I'm experimenting around with the process, seeing how to perfect it and, and where it takes me. Straightforward uh, sketch up model in the lower left. There it is on the lower right with just shader light. So you can see the grass looks very different and the water looks very different. And then I'm using the same technique with colored marker, a little bit of pencil work, and then the lower um, image is the original artwork. Again, look how pale it is. My tendency would be to add black and add contrast to it. I'm purposely holding back and preventing that from happening because I'm going to get it in my next process, which is scan it, add a watercolor filter, and then this is the final result. So it looks more painted. And it's really cool. It's been, it's been fun kind of playing around with it. And it could be a small project or a large project. This is all the same, same process. A special model on the left, the rendered version in the middle, and then the, the artwork on the right, and then the digital watercolor, the final product. So, and that's, so that's one way of, of kind of, of coming up with new, new exploring new ground as far as merging uh, digital and, and traditional. Now, digital montage, same thing. Now, this, this is a landscape architect in Austin that is merging photography with SketchUp, with um, digital painting, with hand drawing. So that grass that you see right there is actual uh, photograph. And that texture on the lower right is Photoshop. And uh, so I started playing around with that too. Started with a photograph right here that I took. And uh, there's a digital drawing that I did on a Cintiq. So it's a one pixel wide drawing. It's, electric, it's uh, done with a stylus pen. And uh, then I cut the photograph back into this, uh, layered the photo right back into it. And so there's a bit of photograph showing through here. It's very pale, but it's giving me a little bit more um, shadow and texture. And then I printed it and then uh, added some colored marker and some colored pencil to get this montage, this digital montage of photography. And, uh, and other people are kind of playing around with it as well, um, adding photography and digital painting and SketchUp modeling and hand drawing. This big mashup of all of these different kind of digital and traditional methods um, all happening together and uh, coming up with interesting results. And, some, and, and here's a professional that's making a living off of doing this kind of uh, deal. Now I'll finish up with uh, just some kind of cool studies of uh, uh, playing around with how, it's, how, I, how I approach the project. This was a, uh, um, in the gold mining district of, of Nevada, um, uh, we wanted to put together a little visitor center. And uh, so we started with sketches. And, uh, and I think accompanying any of this brainstorming comes a glass of wine uh, with that. I think that was sort of mandatory at that point. But you can see how rough the sketch is. Um, and from that rough sketch, that was the earliest concept. That's a thumbnail sketch. We built a SketchUp model. This is a stage set SketchUp model. You can see from above, there's not much to it. It's just this one little scene with some buildings. And that background that you see there, that view of that valley, is literally a vertical plane with a photograph slapped onto it. And the SketchUp view, this is the final view that I was creating from that model. So it only created one view. This is all I needed to get from that model. And uh, from here, I went into the, uh, the watercolor processes, the digital watercolor process. I lightened up the image, printed it, colored it in with marker and colored pencil, and then scanned it and applied that watercolor filter. So there's the original artwork on the left, and there's the watercolor filter on the right. And that's the final product. 
of digital watercolor. Pretty cool stuff. I'm really just kind of having such a blast with that. Uh, here's a close-up of what it looks like. Looks very painted. But who would have thought that there's a SketchUp model underneath it? 90% of the work is SketchUp model, and only 10% is actually handcrafted. So it's pretty, it's an awful lot of fun doing that. Here's a little um, project that I did with some students. Um, 1930s book on uh, how a whole book devoted to the traditional method of, of uh, drafting a perspective. So I started there and said, OK, there's got to be a faster way to do this. So I said, OK, well, let's set out to figure out how to do it faster. First and foremost, took the elevations of the house, slapped them on the cardboard, and built a cardboard model. And photographed that cardboard model at the same angle as the house. So I got there. How long does it take to build this uh, cardboard model? Maybe a couple of hours at the most. It doesn't take too long. It's not that hard to do. And uh, so I arrived at that perspective uh, using a 3D model. How about SketchUp? Imported the uh, site plan and the building elevation and built myself a SketchUp model. In this case, it took half the time. I could get that model built in an hour and, uh, and then create the exact same view, same camera, focal length, everything uh, of that SketchUp model, and then printed it out. And, then had, and this is student drawing. Um, added some Brahma windows, changed the building a little bit, and uh, created a drawing from that SketchUp model. How about if I would add some 3D trees, some components to the model, um, and uh, really jazz up the model. And so here I did, I exported the print and then drew directly on the print. So just, here's that, again, it's that uh, scan composite, uh, or the composite drawing method. So what, uh, what I found in all of this uh, exploration is that uh, um, I think it's, it's great to keep your eyes open and embrace technology in a big way. And that's why I'm so impressed with what, what you guys are doing here with some of the digital uh, tablet uh, explorations and projects. So really, really see where it takes you uh, and integrate uh, that digital technology into whatever you do to speed up the process, to make it more effective in just communicating your design. Um, always add authenticity to your drawing with entourage and people and, and uh, uh, um, uh, context. Um, anytime you can cut corners like this, you're going to be able to devote more time into actual design. And in previous years, I've seen more people focus in all of their energies in the presentation and not so much in the design. And I think it should be flipped. Spend most of your time designing, and then whatever you can do to scrub up a presentation with these fast tools that I, I, I'm showing you, that's where you want to be. Because I think the ultimate is to really get, communicate good design in the best way you can. And uh, I especially have fun in the whole process. So that's, that concludes uh, my presentation. And it's at 7.30. So to run, uh, welcome to go. Um, if you have questions, uh, uh, fire them off right now and I'll be able to answer them. Uh, but it's okay for you guys to run. Some of you, to, uh, if you have to bolt, go ahead. Won't hurt my feelings, but if you have some questions, uh, love to answer some questions if you have any. Um, and uh, I'll hang out for a while too. And you're welcome to come on up and uh, uh, ask uh, if you've got a specific question to ask. Happy to answer it. Anything, any, anything, anybody off the top of your head, any questions? Sir, are you a student on the floor now? Almost so, Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I just wanted to point out something that was obvious to you, I'm sure, may not be obvious to people in the audience. That is, there are a lot of decisions about what's in those drawings, what makes a, you know, a space exciting, 
things like that, which you learn over a long period of time from observing environments and working with environments. And so a lot of the students will be at a different point in their careers where they need to go out, and my plug is to go out and sketch environments, go out and look at them and observe what's going on there. What are the people doing in an environment that seems interesting, that the, what they're doing? What, what's, what makes a particular space that they're in interesting? And what makes it exciting or energizes with the term use? I think that's, uh, that's so true, Paul. Um, that website, it really worth looking at uh, going to the Urban Sketchers website. Um, this uh, uh, huge movement going on, uh, um, big workshops, big, uh, Frank Chang's doing a workshop, I think this come, upcoming month in San Francisco, uh, Urban Sketchers workshop, taking a whole group of people out and just sketching. And I think that that, uh, that you stop and you observe, because you're drawing it, you have to, and you have to really see and understand what's out there and to be able to get it done on paper. Um, as you were talking about that, I'm thinking, Wow, it'd be interesting to go out and just to go down to downtown in Muncie just uh, um, on Sunday morning when no one's around, just kind of photograph a couple of places and then go back there at other times of the day or on a Friday evening in midsummer, photograph that same scene and, and see how that ca character of that scene changes and it's filled with cars and people and activities, or even how the light changes from uh, daytime to nighttime. Uh, it'd be really interesting to just kind of do the side-by-side -side comparison of, of, of activity, space, quality of light, using the same thing side-by-side. Uh, -side. Cool. Question? Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate your time. Break. You've had it already? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it changes. It's nuts uh, how many different colleges are just there from week to week. In, in recognition for your visit, we thank you so much for coming to Ball State Gym. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Well, I'll present to, to you the original artwork by a local artist. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is our Ball State campus. In, in so, oh, that's, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Look at that, that's beautiful. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff.